people can jump in at any time and we will make a recording of this available on YouTube um, at the end. There's a lot of people who had a tutorial at this time or a lecture and um, it's just unfortunate. These are our first year webinars first and foremost and we've kind of snuck them into a little pocket but unfortunately that doesn't suit second year or possibly even third year so we'll just do our best. Um, probably the the first thing I need to do is introduce myself. My name is Caleb Owens. I'm the first year director. And this is the first webinar we've invited other students to. But um, Sean, who's there, wave Sean. Right. Sean and I have been having bi weekly webinars now for about a month. I think this is our 12th or 13th. Um, we received a student engagement grant at the end of 2019. We were going to do this anyway, basically. Um, ironically, at the beginning of this semester, once the university realized its financial situation, they removed the grant. Um, but Sean and I thought, well, there's no time where we need to engage with students better. So that's what these are all about. Engaging with students, um, sometimes it's a bit tedious because we'll have a focus on an assignment or an assessment or something like that. And some of our previous webinars have been like that. Um, but this is more about intended to be more about mental health, but again, from a student perspective. So you guys are all students. Um, and um, something I wanna say before we even set off is just an important disclaimer that we're not offering mental health advice to individuals in this webinar. If we get personal questions, we may refer them on or give general advice only. Um, but this is really more about student engagement, kind of raising issues, helping you guys see where you might need help um, and so on, as opposed to specific advice. So let's all introduce ourselves. So uh, Nadia, who are you? Hi, um, well, I'm Nadia. I'm in my second year of Masters of Clinical Psychology. At the University of at Sydney. At the University of Sydney. Yeah. Second year. And if you hear me say MCP, that's, I mean, Masters of Clinical Psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Nadia. Thank you. And Miranda? Hi, I'm Miranda. So I'm also doing the Masters of Clinical Psychology with Nadia and I'm also doing it as, a, as the combined program with a PhD. Oh, what's your PhD topic? I'm under the supervision of Louise Sharp and I'm looking at the adaptation process to having an amputation um, and developing a cognitive model from lived experience. Oh, fascinating. And Astrid? I'm Astrid. I'm also studying with um, Nadia and Miranda. I'm also a second year MCP and um, doing a PhD as well. And what's your topic, Astrid? Um, I'm with Professor Stephen Towers and my topic is exercise and eating disorders and looking at psychometric measures and their properties. And was it you, Astrid, that had um, experience working as a psychologist abroad or? Yes. Yes. What about that? Where were you working? Um, I was working at a child and adolescent mental health inpatient unit. Wow. Yeah, it was great. It was really, it was really good. Definitely a relevant experience. So far more uh, expertise than Caleb and I could ever offer. So it's great to have you guys on. Thanks. Shall we get to answering questions, Caleb? I'm just, I'm just struggling with Mentimeter at the moment. So <laughs> bear with me. Um, well, guys, I'll say to the people in attendance, um, make sure you log on to Mentimeter. It's there on Canvas. Uh, you can vote for questions. So we'd prefer to not have to go through every question and skip them. So if you guys can just vote for the ones that you think are the ones you want most answered. So rather than just repeating the same ones. Okay. I hope I haven't mixed up my presentations, but um, first thing I wanted to ask is where is everyone from? Because um, most of the time we have um, first year psychology students. Just going to check. Now, if you were looking through questions, you might be a bit frustrated that I've switched back to this, but. Um, oh, fascinating. So, um, Nadia, Astrid, Miranda, what they're doing now is everyone, everyone online can now interact with Menti, Mentimeter and kind of give their input. Um, it's a little crude for things like this. There's a few people lurking from somewhere else. Um, this is software we use in big lecture halls and it really um, 
that really helps engagement with the audience. We've got a fairly even spread across the years, which is excellent. You saw my last minute announcement at 10 o'clock this morning. Um, let's see if this thing has broken or if I can. Okay. Um, I stopped at nine for this one because it was just getting too depressing. <laughs> Um, and I've since thought of several more, so sorry. <laughs> sorry if you've missed out on your particular thing. You can answer more than one of these. Um, so this is just to give us a visualization of what people are struggling Lovely graphic, with. isn't it? Yeah, Where yeah fancy. it's very fancy. I wonder what happens when the, maybe the circles will shrink when it gets too populated. Mm -hmm. I'm personally, I'm struggling with increased carer responsibilities, or I was until my son went back to school yesterday. Mm. So he's even been in a few webinars. He's been sitting next to me right now, but he's actually at school now, which is a relief for him and me. Um, We're definitely seeing clusters, aren't we? Mm. Uh, look, the, the one I, I left out was um, domestic issues, things like domestic violence and domestic conflict, or even lower level stuff like you find yourself suddenly trapped with someone who you don't really know, or you've just moved into a flat, you have a new flatmate, and suddenly you were told, yep, you're now stuck with them, you can't talk to anyone else directly for months and months. Okay, so um, stress, anxiety, depression, sadness, loneliness, sleep problems. I expected unemployment or underemployment to be greater, but um, because it has affected students greatly. But, um, okay, now this is open-ended and I've got the swear filter on, but you're most welcome to try and defeat it <laughs> if you want. <laughs> um, Mentimeter has a swear filter, filter in 26 languages. Um, <laughs> We asked this a few weeks ago in one of our first webinars and um, got some interesting responses. So those will appear as people mean. Memes. <laughs> I agree. I saw the greatest Caleb meme I've ever seen on UCED Rants. Yeah, Can you I share know. it, Caleb? Do you have it? No, I'm not showing that. That is <laughs> Animal Crossing. Or Ragnarok or something. Listening to music I like. Wine. Exercising. <laughs> Wine, yeah. Taken to day drinking. Yeah, we see a lot of that coming up. That mm -hmm. is a concern. I like this one about lowering my expectations of how productive mm. I can be. That's a good one. Yeah, there, was the, there were a few memes going around initially saying, look, you've got all this free time. You can learn a new language. You can finish your university, you can do all this work and achieve all these things and get fit. But then I saw counter memes saying things like, hang on, give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. um, don't go so hard on yourself. It's not as if you just have free time. One of my tutors likened it to being in prison <laughs> and without realizing that, no, that's a terrible, terrible thing because you're being forced to do this against your will. You didn't choose to have a break. You didn't choose to have a holiday. Mm. There's a good one. Following a routine, setting blocks in my Google Calendar. Mm. One of uh, there was one there that was talking about falling in love with a TV uh, TV show. One of my friends is an epidemiologist, yeah. um, and he's had to stop working because he uh, actually contracted uh, uh, COVID nineteen, and so now this is the first break he's had in three three to four months, and so he's watching extremely bad Korean TV shows. And he's saying that he's behaving like a uh, like he would imagine a sixteen year old would. Oh dear. I, I found he's a real gem sassy. last week. It's on Netflix. It's called "I Am Not Okay with This." Hmm. And you think it's going to be violent and horror, and there's a teeny tiny bit of that, but it's mainly about a, a teenage woman who is just not coping well and discovers that the angrier she gets, she can actually affect the outside world directly. It's it's um quite fantastic. I am not okay with this. Do you guys have any um, opinions on uh, telehealth, like in regards to mental health? So online forums for like, yeah, clinical support? Yeah, we probably support? do because that's what we've been doing now for what, four weeks or something? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's been, it's definitely been 
a change if you're not sitting right across from someone there's a lot of things you miss out on but i think it always it also makes you pay really keen attention to what's going on as well and mm. my experience has been really positive i've had all my clients come back and they've been really regular and we've been able to get good work done so mm. yeah been good yeah i in my opinion i think it's not ideal i'd definitely rather face-to-face -face contact but uh, mental health is so important right now and I think it's a brilliant substitute mm. um, to get support during this time mm. when that's all we really have. And it does break down some of the barriers of for people that maybe struggle to get into a clinic or to mm. like in normal times whereas here you're already in your house all you have to do is log on to your computer mm. um, for that and there's also Black Dog um, Institute has a number of great free online um, therapy modules like um and an online clinic as well that's sort of self-paced rather than um or we can go and see it see um, it can you email me that now miranda and i'll <laughs> stick it up on the screen for people yeah want me to put it into the chat um that's a great yeah. idea isn't it yeah, yeah put it in the chat put it straight in the chat they've got, um they've got some great resources there so we know from teaching that there's like issues with picking up on cues. So you pick up on a lot of natural cues when you're teaching about like whether students are understanding, whether they're engaged. And so do you find that sort of thing there as well with the um, clinical side or is it a bit easier? I would say it's a little bit easier than class um, because class, you know, you can mute yourself, put your video um turn your video off um, but when at least when we're doing telehealth um, we still have video and we ask them um, all of our clients that we work with to turn notifications off and um, because we still have that face-to-face -face contact we can look and see whether someone's engaged and I think a lot of us are making adaptions so we can share screens and um, just work on the same things that we would have otherwise, but just um, using a different platform. So in terms of engagement, personally, I haven't found a problem with it so far because we're still seeing someone's face and we try and make eye contact with them and things like that. Uh, Zoom I think, is a, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, I think it's also easier because we actually have seen our patients face to face before going to telehealth. Mm. So I'm going to be curious about what it's going to be like when we start seeing someone we haven't previously seen and don't know very well. So that might change a bit. I was just going to say Zoom is an odd beast because while it does cut down on the number of cues you can see, a lot of students are more comfortable than they would be in class. We're seeing in some cases higher participation rates. Mm -hmm. um, that's what tutors just said in a tutors meeting. But at the same time, it's, you know, I think I agree with you, Nadia, it's not as good. It's good to keep us going through these difficult times, but it's not as good. I had a very challenging um, integrity meeting um, a few weeks ago, and I didn't realize that the person I was interviewing was having so much trouble understanding me because I wasn't getting those cues that their English perhaps wasn't great. Um, and that's never happened to me before. I'm usually pretty cluey. Oh yeah, they're not getting it. I better explain it in a different way. And it was just too subtle but they were nodding politely and I took that to mean I just understood what you said and they clearly didn't, um, which was unfortunate. Um, let me go back to the screen. We've got even more ideas coming in now. Every now and again, we see something worrying. I just saw nothing. I'm not. Mm. That's a pity. Video games with friends. I don't know what a dark web is. Sean, do you know what a dark web is? I do know what the dark web is, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's that dark. Netflix. I that's don't know. One, sort of with the theme of staying connected with friends, whether that's <laughs> through um, calling or Zoom. I think that mm. one's really important, keeping up some of that social connection. Yeah. Even my nine-year-old had a Zoom play date a few weeks ago, and he carried the iPad around the whole house and showed his friend every room in our house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's one of the things that's oddly recorded. intimate, isn't it? That's what the tutors have been saying as well, that there's like this odd intimacy that you get because people are now in your house. It's not just that you're... <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we had a webinar a few weeks ago, and someone saw Lego in the background of my room, and um, that turned out quite bizarre. I went to get a Lego set and my son got his Lego set. Um, 
you've got to watch out what's in your background. I think that is an interesting point for telehealth as well, because um, it does give you some cues into what your client's sort of environment might look like, which gives you some cues around mm. their functioning, their coping or who they are as a person. And mm. it's right. It is kind of that intimacy of being invited into someone's bedroom in a way. Yeah. Faces give you so much more information than just what they're saying. So it's a big step up from a phone call. You get that background. Um, yeah, I've seen some, I've had some um, Zoom meetings where you can tell the person is desperately unhappy. Or maybe mm. they haven't brushed their hair. They're not ready for the day. Um, they haven't slept well. That's good and bad. It connects you a lot more than before, but um, it means that someone is aware that they're kind of a bit more exposed. So what I discovered in the tutors meeting an hour ago is that in our tutorials, most of our students are hiding their video when the tutor is there. But when we do breakout rooms, a lot of the students switch on their video because they they know they're just with um, their classmates then. So that's something I just yeah. recently learned. I put in that um, link you just suggested. Mm -hmm. So that's in the chat too, but I'll let that linger there for a moment. So if anyone's watching the recording, they can copy that down. This is passive resources only or? Um, so this will, this has a whole bunch of different fact sheets, but it has also got links to their online clinic um, and some of their, their self-paced self-help tools, mm -hmm. um, sort of all on this landing page. So they have some really good fact sheets and resources also about creating a self-help plan, uh, self-care plan, sorry, um, ways to function well, working from home, um, things around exercise and sleep during COVID. Um, so a whole range of things that is really useful and just in bite-sized little fact sheets. Yeah, excellent. Just while I'm here, I also had open and ready a uh, link to the, the, the psychology clinic page. Now, can you guys talk us through it? You don't need a referral through a GP to go to our psychology clinic. How does it work? So, sorry, you, do you guys mind? You can... No, you go. Yeah, okay, if, you, if I forget something, please do interrupt. So, um, people can just call the clinic um, phone number. And usually what happens is that they're um, being referred to one of us to do an intake, which is about a half hour phone call where we um, talk, to pe talk to people about you know, why they want to come to the clinic and what their um, presenting concern is. And then we forward this information to the clinic director who ultimately makes a decision on whether or not, you know, we would be a suitable service. Um, I don't know what it's like right now. I think it's in the process of changing because intake was closed. Mm. Intake uh, is now opened. Right. Uh, yeah, so our number is 91144343. Um, and I think, I believe as of tomorrow, we'll be conducting intake. Um, so I think you'll be, you'll call um, that number, uh, the receptionist Elaine will answer um, and take down your details. And then um, someone from the clinic will give you a call to conduct the intake. Okay, excellent. The other, again, before we move to questions, the other page, I don't have it open yet. I did this on purpose. It's something else for students to access. If you go to current students and go to, should be really easy to find, support and services. And then you will see health, wellbeing and support services there. Counseling and mental health support, as well as lots of other support. Um, do you get to the clinic eventually if you go through here? I think it's maybe right down the bottom. I think it's CAPS first and then the support line. Okay. It's just, I did a mental health first aid okay. course last year and the convener of our course didn't know about the psychology clinic. And luckily Belinda was actually doing the course at the same time who works in the clinic and was able to explain. No, it's actually not on that page. Is it? Yeah. So that's okay. That, I suspected that was the case. That's why I went to the psychology <laughs> clinic first because maybe the, for some reason or other, the university is not linking directly to it. But those are the resources and I'll leave those tabs there just in case things come up later. 
anything new come up here? We've got 51 responses. Constancy and routine. Um, normality. Managing norm, understandings of normality. Let me move to the questions. Oh, I don't, I'll come back to that one. We've now got 40 questions. Um, yeah, now that so, I'm on this page, you cannot vote questions so that the most popular ones will come to the top. So are we ready? We don't have to race through these. <laughs> um, yell out if you want to be the first one to answer any of these. Let's go. Tips for Zoom call nerves. Seems more intimidating to talk online than in a tutorial room. I guess See, I come back to that. I thought it was the opposite. Really people were less anxious about. Well, there are five people that have um, upvoted this, okay. so I guess some people are feeling quite nervous. Um, one second. What does everyone think about it? I think, um, like as we we're saying, like it comes down to that level of intimacy. But maybe it is thinking about if you're worried about what your background shows, planning that out, or making sure you're dressed as if you would be going to uni um, yeah. to help with that kind of normalcy um, would be my first sort of two initial ideas on that. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. I first experienced Zoom in January where I think the train stopped working. Um, I just got to Bondi Junction Station and they said, no, no trains. Um, so I came home and I joined my nine o'clock meeting via Zoom and I've never been more anxious and paid more attention to a meeting in my life because I was familiar with the meeting room and I knew that all these high powered university folks were sitting around a table and I would have been on this big plasma screen. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't mute my video and I, they, you know, I was, you know, it, had I been there in person, I would have been checking my email and bumming around and reading the Sydney Morning Herald. But because I was on Zoom, I just felt terrified. And that was 90 minutes of hell. So I definitely went in person to those meetings. Maybe that's what they're getting at. But it's... And, and I think it's a bit awkward. Like, it's awkward as hell, actually, seeing yourself constantly. Because you're not used to seeing yourself really, are you? You're just always mm -hmm. seeing other people. So it's really a bit weird seeing yourself on your own computer screen. I think that's no, I, it definitely made me pay more attention to how I look when I'm talking or any of yeah. those things. I always look pink, but there's no way I'm going to change my life. I guess the follow-up for them is what's actually causing you to have those nerves. I don't have motivation to study and do things. It's not a question per se, but I guess it is something worth talking about for sure. Okay. How to build up motivation. Any ideas? I would say it's it's so normal at this time to have low motivation. Um, so just to kind of accept how you're feeling in the present um, rather than feeling worse because you don't have motivation. So everyone has different circumstances at the moment. Everyone's going through a lot of stress. So I would encourage people to just um, be kind to yourself and accept that this is just normal for the present circumstances. I also think... You know, if you really want to try, do something and you're really struggling to work up the initiative, ask yourself some questions like, um, you know, what long-term gains can I get from this? Um, why is it important? What will happen if I don't do it? Um, and then, you know, doing things like to-do lists and scheduling and planning little rewards for yourself after you've achieved even something very small, um, just to get the ball rolling in the kind of initial stages. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really beautiful answer, Nadia. Can I just add one more thing? I'm sort of thinking through around like the, um, particularly I think it's so important to be kind to yourself at this time, but maybe even if you're setting like a small goal of say that's the assignment you want to work on and it's like, I'm just going to do an hour of this. And sometimes that might be all you do. Sometimes just starting it and doing that small bit will give you that, need for a little, all that um, drive to do a little bit more but then like Nadia said the reward for ticking off that little goal is a really great idea. Yeah. I think and what would also be important is that usually when you physically go into uni and do stuff other people set a routine for you mm. so you don't have to put any energy into doing that for yourself which is now changed so it 
kind of needs energy in the first place to just set up a routine that's normally just a given. Right. But it might it's be worth a thinking great point. about. Yeah, it might be worth thinking about if it's still worth it to try and keep going with the routine. I think that was some of the comments from before mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a live lecture recording on Canvas now from me in week one, telling students that it's better to come into lectures because what we found in the past is that while it's convenient to look at the lecture recordings, most people don't get to those lecture recordings. They just let them build up. They hoard mm -hmm. them and then they cognitively, cognitively offload their anxiety and say, well, because I have a recording, an MP3 on my hard drive, I don't need to watch it. And then come exam time, they just explode because they realize they've got 57 hours worth of lectures to watch. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. missing out on that physical, I'm here, other people are doing this, the time is fixed. Yeah. They've lost their routine, from, basically. And it's great to hear from the clinical perspective as well. So from education, it follows on a lot from what Nadia and Miranda and Ashford were saying, where it's like, if you set yourself goals that are attainable and actually set them, not just have them as some loose idea in your head, just to write them down, formalize them, it does end up increasing their uptake. Mm -hmm take a complex task and break it into lots of little smaller tasks. That's what I heard from an ed educational perspective. Mm. Um, but then in addition to that, we need to be rewarding ourselves after yeah. each little bit. Um, that's really well. important. And that's part of like the self care that's going to help you to keep going in the next day, be able to do those tasks again. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good question to start on. I feel mm. it's going to cover a lot of the other content we're going to hit yep. as well. I like the idea of becoming a clinical psych, but I'm worried I won't be able to deal with the heavy issues. Is this something you learn to deal with or should I not pursue this path? It's a great question. It's well, a good question. And one that Caleb and I in previous career. weeks would say, we have no expertise in being able to answer this. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to start again, Nadia, and then we'll go through our experts? Um, I think, and it's, it's definitely what, um, universities look at when you're applying to become or applying to be um, a clinical master's student is the level of experience you have. So um, I think if you like the idea of becoming a clin psych, it's important to get some kind of um, experience in the field to figure out whether it's for you, how you can cope um, with the kind of exposure that you, you get during this experience. And then that will be the best kind of indicator as to whether it's something you want to pursue. Can I ask a follow-up, Nadia? So you're saying like, uh, get some experience and yeah. where could you do that? What are some types of experience that you could gain for yeah. undergrads? Yeah, uh, so uh, things like volunteering at Lifeline is quite common. Um, any other kind of um, crisis or over the phone counseling. Um, uh, I don't know if this is really happening at the moment because of COVID, but things like becoming an ABA therapist um, that um, involves um, behaviour therapy with often young children with autism. Um, so that is um, some kind of the experience. Other things is working as a research assistant in a clinical setting. Um, I'm sure there are opportunities within the university to do that. Um, even anything where you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone is also a good indicator, um, like disability work. Yeah. Um, Miranda, did you want to take a shot at this? What's a heavy issue? <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, I do hear this sort of colloquially from people when I say that I'm starting to be a psychologist around like, oh, how can you handle hearing everyone's problems or um, taking on all their struggles um, and I think there is there is training in our program around how to handle those things one of the the things I, I learned this in undergrad which I love this metaphor for being able to handle some of those the heavier issues is um, as a psychologist being like a bucket so everyone sort of pours a lot of their worries or their concerns into you and you sort of fill up but if you don't have any holes in your bucket, you're just going to fill up and overflow. And that's when you won't be able to handle those heavy issues. But it's around being a bucket that has holes in it. So all of those things come through where the container, but they then flow out of us. Um, and the way you drill those holes into your bucket um, is doing things like self-care or that 
things that help you to stay well. So like exercise, debriefing with your supervisor, talking to your colleagues. Um, and I think that really helps to be able to, to take on the things that we might hear in a session. Um, so it's not that you're cold hearted and unfeeling. It's that you have a way of releasing <laughs> yeah, those stress, yeah, stressful emotions. Yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> Astra, did you have a perspective on this one? Yes. Um, I think there's three things that are potentially important to keep in mind. So number one is that, as Miranda already said, like the clinical degree prepares you quite well in a sense. So first, um, we have a lot of supervision. So for every client day, we have two hours of supervision and that is kind of, so kind of serves the purpose to address issues such as, you know, how do I cope with X? Um, and because we get so much of it, it's really a process over those two years that, you know, helps you develop a sustainable model for yourself. The other thing is that when you're a clinic, you're not just sitting in a room with the patient and have to fix their problem. There's many, you know, evidence-based therapies that are manualized that you can use to help. There's, you know, very well validated strategies that people use. So essentially you have a bit of a manual that helps you with dealing with things as well. Mm. Um, and I think the third thing is that it's very important. And I think it ties in with what Miranda said. It's very important to maintain boundaries so this thing of, you know, that people always say, don't take it home. But I think that's actually a good way to look at it because, you know, you're dealing with these things in your role as a professional. You're not dealing with these things in your role as a private person. And I think it's just important to maintain that distinction. Yeah. That's excellent. Okay. It was very careers based. So if we come across any more like that, we might save them for our Friday. Mm webinar but it's obviously a very popular question now this one is more back to uni study. is great when i'm studying all these course content but then my mental health sub, uh, spirals when i've got to do assignments even when i'm good with time management this is the case what's this about uh, yes yeah, so i'm who want to who pass this on to first do you guys have any opinions um can i actually start with this one and then you guys can either kind of completely contradict me or back me up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the problem here is in the way that they're thinking of their course, that it is this wonderful time until there's an assignment and they're not doing what Nadia suggested earlier, which is to break something down into little steps and do their assignments all the time. Their assignment is part of the course. This is something Sean and I have been trying for years now to try and get people to start their research report early. We even collect comments from the previous year students to tell the following year students, start your research report early, spread it out, take it easy. This idea that uni is lovely, but then they see these critical, you know, assignment now, assignment now, and all their stress is focused on that. That's my two cents, but yeah. Nadia, what do you reckon? Um, yeah, it definitely could be that, but because they said, even when I'm good with time management, it makes mm. me think there might be a bit more to it. So what's coming to my mind is that um, this student is enjoying the content and enjoying learning, but finds stressful assignments stressful for a particular reason. So it might be because, you know, getting a mark is a stressful thing. Like um, if you're ref using that mark to reflect your capabilities, that is really stressful. Or thinking like, um, I need to get a certain standard. Otherwise, you know, there might be all these repercussions. Um, mm. You know, if people are setting rules for themselves, that's good um, that people want to be motivated, but it is, it can be stressful when you're, you know, pinning your self-esteem or your perceived intellect to marks. Yeah. Um, so my advice for that is <laughs> it's difficult. Um, it's not something that, you know, you can change overnight, but um, I guess it comes back to what I said earlier, just in terms of being kind to yourself. Yeah. Um, know that there are lots of ex circumstances going on right now that can influence the grades that you get, um, including increased stress, uh, lots of uncertainty, um, changes to our concentration abilities, um, instead of kind of putting all our eggs in one basket and thinking that, you know, we need a certain grade. Otherwise, so it reflects badly on me. Their like problematic that. cognition is they're, they're linking their mark to their self, to their yeah. self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. When in fact, 
it's really just a measure of how appropriate their response was, how, how well they mastered the material. Sean and I get a lot of feedback from students, particularly about our research report. I tried hard, I put a lot of effort into it, therefore I deserve a better mark and we need to explain, no, you've kind of, your effort has been misplaced and this mark is just how well you achieved you know, our very specific learning outcomes and well done, you got a mark, you submitted something. It's quite tragic when people don't submit anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, so Miranda, what do you think mm. about? I think, um, Nadia, that was a beautiful response and really good to think about what it is around the assignment that is causing the stress, like around whether around the mark. I'm also thinking too, like assignments are stressful. Uni um, is stressful when it is about we need to just achieve certain grades to then maybe make it into honours or around that. But also I'm thinking when they say the, the mental health spirals around that is looking at what are you doing to maintain overall well-being throughout the whole course? Um, so do you have those practices in place throughout the course that is around good mental health and well-being? So around exercising, having social connections, um, having time out to downtime, sort of whether that's meditation or some sort of relaxation. Um, those sort of things are really important all the time and often they're the first things to go when stress sort of spikes, so say with the assignment. Um, so I would really encourage to keep that the whole time through. And it's hard when you do have the time demands of an assignment that's coming up, but still making time to do those other things that are going to help with your overall well-being, which is going to help particularly during a stressful time. Yeah, and to build off of that, I think a lot of students incorrectly assume that the entire point of their education, tertiary higher education, is to achieve a mark when mm -hmm. in reality you're developing as a human being. You're trying to become... A better person so I think that if you can practice what like Miranda's saying in terms of trying to improve your own emotion your own cognition like Caleb would say as well mm. it's that's part of it part of it is developing as a human being a responsible human uh, it reminds me of something that happened in a webinar last week when someone asked what is a good report mark and Sean just instinctively said, well, I don't know, the average is 60. So if you got <laughs> above, but I said, look, a lot of you will get 40 out of 100 in a report. And you might be very disappointed by that, but 40 is a long way from zero. Mm -hmm. And you've come a long way. You probably aren't quite on top of APA style, but who, you know, who among us is. But, um, you know, you should be very kind to yourself. You got, I always get this wrong, Sean, but you got 12 of the 25%. Oh, you got, 11 of the 25%? All for 40. 10, sorry. You got 10 of the 25%. Mm. The person who got 50 and passed got 12 and a half of that 25%. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing we care about. You still did, gave it a good shot um, and you did quite well. In other words, their comparison point, if it's to the rest of the class, that's going to be devastating for them. I went to a selective high school and I was lucky enough to be almost the top of the selective high school the whole way through. But I had friends who were not performing very well and yet they went spectacularly well in the HSC. And I remember getting calls from them on the morning, the results came out and they were saying things like, oh, I only got 92 or I only got 93. Mm -hmm. And they'd been unhappy for their whole six years of high school because they hadn't been reflecting on just how much they'd been learning. They were only comparing themselves to mm -hmm. other people. And in terms of research reports, like you learn so much that you don't even, that's not attributed to the mark. Like you've learned how to read a research report. You've learned how to do all of these things that you probably didn't know how to do when you first started. So you're learning a lot of these skills that don't translate to marks very well. Yeah. Any comments, Astrid? Um, just sort of some re resource um, comments. So I think like if this is a question that centers more around how do I structure myself appropriately, I think the learning center also has some, great courses that are sort of centered around that if I remember correctly and then what I was thinking about you know because the person made a comment on mental health it also depends on what that looks like and maybe they would benefit from accessing CAPS or accessing the clinic depending on you know what kind of mental health issues they're experiencing with regards to this yeah okay I'm gonna have you be the first person to answer the next question Astrid Okay. So can you read it out, Sean? I think taking a break for my mental health has turned into an overly used excuse for procrastinating. Is that possible? I.e., how does one find the line between discipline 
and working too much? I've got this question so many times from my own class. Okay. <laughs> How do you define procrastination versus yeah. taking a break? But Astrid, what? Let me think about this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Astrid? Taking a break. In other words, their little reward for themselves has kind of got out of control. Yeah. So I, it reads like someone was just really, you know, stressed from uni and decided to like take a bit of time off, which I think in and of itself is fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in terms of the, you know, finding a line between discipline and, and working too much, I think that's someone that probably everybody struggles with. And what I've learned, like with doing my PhD in particular, because it's such, it's a process that's going on for so long and it's so intricate and detailed, um, is that, you know, motivation kind of naturally fluctuates over that time. And it's hard to hold yourself to a standard where you expect to have sort of equal levels of energy and motivation to do things all the time. Um, and it comes back to, I think what Nadia mentioned before, so, you know, be kind to yourself, insofar as that's possible. If you've got an assignment due in two days, it might not be, but, um, you know, accept that there's these fluctuations in motivation and it will most likely, you know, resolve itself. It's the first time we've heard the word fluctuation today. And it reminds me of a, an interview I listened to yesterday on the radio of a teacher who's been in Spain for the past month and has been locked down for 50 days hasn't been able to leave the house and he, well, he's finally able to leave the house now. And the interviewer on ABC asked him what's been the hardest thing. And he said, my mood, not mood per se, whether it's high or low, but waking up in the morning and not knowing what kind of mood this day will bring almost as if it's randomly fluctuating, it's out of our control. It kind of is mood motivation. These things that are influenced by so many factors. Um, that just coping with that uncertainty of, you know, what kind of mood I'm going to be in. It was interesting. That was, that was his 50 day quarantine feedback that that was the worst, even if it was a good mood, the fact that that was unpredictable and unexpected too, was a bit concerning. It was just fluctuating, but I guess you guys need to give people the tools to handle those fluctuations so that a little self reward doesn't turn into a, a skiing holiday or something. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Miranda? Um, I think too the the you know asking around what's the difference between the break and the procrastination, mm -hmm. and it would be if the break is a it's going too long and you're feeling like oh, I should go back. But what is around the procrastinating? Is it around feeling um, anxiety or nervous to return to whatever the task is? Or is it you are just mentally exhausted and do need to watch another episode on Netflix? Or is it, yeah, trying to avoid the task? Um, so having sort of that think around what is this break? What, what am I, why am I taking this break? Um, and yeah, that that line there and I guess the line what was the last bit the line between self-discipline and, and working self through much. yeah I think um it is yeah so that that overwork if you are feeling mentally exhausted at the end of every day and like you can't continue on the next day that's probably getting to the point of too much because it's you want to be able to to continue on like uni and life more broadly but it's it's a marathon it's not a sprint of um, got to just punch out an assignment because there's going to be another one that comes along. And so being able to pace yourself and that comes back to that really having some good um, self-care and some good boundaries and some good um, practices in place to prepare for that. I like your first response to that, Miranda, which was something mm -hmm. along the lines of kind of classify the break. Are you taking yeah. a break to avoid yeah. it or yeah. are you taking the break for self-care? Taking a yeah. break to avoid the work you're going to have a lot more trouble getting back to the work. Mm -hmm. So make it clear in your head why you're taking the break. Yeah, a lot more guilt if it's to avoid it. Rather uh, than, yeah. Did you have anything to add, Nadia? Um, I think most of it has been said, but yeah, just building on what Miranda said, procrastination, 
at its core is an avoidance behavior and you're avoiding something because it produces anxiety. Whereas taking a break is um, because you need a rest. So like the function of the behavior is quite different. So if you're not sure which one you're doing, you can just take a few minutes of a break and think, okay, why am I doing this? Is it because I'm nervous or because I actually need it and I'm feeling quite tired? Um, Yeah. That's what yeah. I was going to say. And That's I have something to write down. I think procrastination is hiding away from something. Taking a break mm-hmm. is relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> and one way to kind of deal with that as well is um, to deciding at the outset, okay, um, like what is my day going to look like? Um, when can I have a break? How long will it go for? When will the break end? When will it I'm, end? I'm dealing so. with this with my nine-year-old who's addicted to <laughs> Fortnite and... The main thing we do when he starts playing is we agree as a family, what is your stopping time? So that he knows, and I've got a great big LCD clock right right below the screen, so he can clearly see that time. How long is my break gonna be? Not an unspecified, I'll get back to this later, and then the rest of the Mm. day is gone. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've kind of got my eye on the time now. So how about we speed things up, and we just have one person jump in, one person answers each question, and we- We kind of do a, a speed round, not to be disrespectful to those asking no. questions, but um, let's let's try and get through them a lot faster. So who wants to answer this one? Do you think that you can still be a good psychologist if you struggle with mental health? Is it a case of using lived experience to help others or do you need to help yourself before others? We've had this question at least five, six times in no. the last three weeks. Who wants to take it? Uh, yes. Okay, Astrid, go. Yes. <laughs> um, I think you can. I think it's not necessarily exclusive, but as with everything else, I think it depends a little bit on what kind of mental health issue we're talking about and what the severity level of it is. So, you know, um, for example, if you're feeling really, really, really depressed, you can't maybe you can't be a psychologist at that point in time, but then at that point in time, you also can't be a teacher or you can't be an accountant Mm. or you can't do another job in the way that it's, it's meant to be done. So I think what you need to ask yourself more than, you know, looking at this as a job specific thing thing is what is sort of my general level of functioning in life? Like, am I able to do a job the way that is supposed to be done? And I don't think there's, a reason why you can't be a psychologist because you've got mental health issues. And I have a number of friends or people that I know who are psychologists and who have at some point in their life, you know, struggled with mental health and it doesn't take away from their capabilities as a psychologist today. Such a lovely point. It's just the job in the end, isn't it? Can you, Um, are your mental health uh, problems interfering with that? It's very hard to study under today's conditions. It's hard to understand the lectures and it's hard for me to process the information. There's no question there, but I guess they're asking for some advice. After us throw to you, Miranda. Um, yeah, well, I think this one, it's definitely that this is normal for now. Like, there's so much anxiety, so much uncertainty, so many fluctuations in mood or your situation, perhaps in wherever, in your living situation or whatever's happening. Um, so it makes sense. Um, I think it's sort of coming back to a lot of the things we've talked about of, um, giving yourself the break when you need it, keeping those things in place of the maybe going for a walk, making sure you have social time um, and being able to, I guess, not being as hard on yourself if you're not being as productive, still showing up to the lecture, um, whether that's online or your tutorials and taking in as much as you can. And maybe it is just um, being asking some extra questions or um sort of just knowing that it's normal, that a lot of people are finding it difficult at the moment. Yeah, it's hard for everyone to focus, Mm -hmm. basically. Do you, Caleb, Sean and the ladies, have any ideas that that if it's necessary that we need to do internships during bachelor degree? If so, we will get any help from the uni. Thanks so much. Well, they mean the undergraduate degree. No, not in psychology. Yeah, do you have to do an internship um, to be able to get into clinical psych? Is that Was that one of the requirements to get into the MCP? Uh, yeah, I think Nadia gave a good rundown of the kinds of work experience that might be 
important. I don't, yeah, I don't think you, you don't need to, sorry if I'm jumping in here, Nadia, as a bit sort of building on what you said, you don't need to, but it is a really good idea to get some right. sort of experience, but it's not formally organised. I end. often say to people, look, you really want to throw yourself into psychology, but until you've been in some difficult situations, you might not realise if it's for you. How would you know? Yeah. yeah. Let's go How to the next you question. Give it, give it I think this has been covered well. Yep. What part of being a clinical psychologist do you not like? <laughs> do any of you want to answer that There's question? There's a careers <laughs> question. Ask on Friday. Question. Paperwork. <laughs> Paperwork. 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 Yeah. Moving right along. <laughs> I think it's a really lovely question, though. I want to have friends, but I also want to be alone. It's a tricky one. It is a tricky one. Who wants to jump in? I can say that I, I feel that way sometimes because I'm quite introverted. I prefer to be alone most of the time, but I do not. I don't want to be in a situation where I don't have any friends. So that means if I do want to hang out with someone, they're Look, not I there. I guess the difficulty of this current situation is you don't have a choice. You're either stuck with a flatmate and can't be alone, <laughs> or you're alone. And and I, and I think choice is important because you need to be able to regulate your alone time and your socialising time. And if you're stuck with one or the other and have no choice, it must be terrible. Is there a clinical perspective? Is there a clinical perspective? <laughs> I'm just thinking like, um, like reflecting on the reasons of, about why you want to be right. alone. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you like, is there some kind of avoidance going on there? Are there some kind of like, you know, negative beliefs driving the avoidance? Um, yeah, it's, it's not really a question, but in terms of my advice, like if you, I would just say if it's kind of impairing the way that you're functioning on a daily basis, then definitely seek help. I think that's a great point for all of the things, isn't it, so far? So like reflection on procrastination, reflection on trying to figure out what's the core. And I think that's something that probably in education we don't think of enough, like why are they why are you even asking this question? Yeah. Sorry, Miranda, you were going to say something. I was just going to say that I think with that one too, it's okay for both. Um, you can do something social and then spend the rest of the evening doing your own thing. Right. It's, it's okay. We, we need social time and we need alone time as well. Right. It's not a dichotomy, is it? It's a false no, dichotomy. Be kind yeah. to yourself. Bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm fixating on getting a HD, which I know is being detrimental for my mental health, but to get back into honours, I do need to get these sorts of marks, so I feel like I have to. Advice. Study anxiety. This is study anxiety. A marks fixation, a performance-based mindset. Uh, in this case, is it is it really a fixation or is it a requirement? So you want to get into an honours program. I don't think they an HD. Honours entry is... Yeah. I think they're saying they need to average that now to account for previous failures to... I know, but that. many students have asked us, what mark do I need to get? And if we answer, it kind of feels absurd. Well, if I set a different number, would you try less hard? It's bizarre. So can't they just try their best? And I'm more worried about the mindset that they're not here to master something or become proficient at something or have confidence in their chosen topic. They're just here to get marks or they're all, or not, no, that's a bit unfair. They're too focused on marks. Would that be a fair? It's hard. It is like valid to focus on your marks because you know you need to get good marks to get into honours. So it's just, I think it's just not an ideal situation. And <laughs> psychology is difficult and has lots of obstacles. So it's really understandable that you're focusing on marks and wanting to get good marks. But I, I agree. All you can do is just try your best and focus on the learning and to try and enjoy that. I just realised too, we're talking to clinical MCP students. It's harder to get into the MCP than it is to get into honours. Um, look, I often say to people, um, you can always do your honours at another university and you can always do your clinical degree at another university. So... I've, I've never found anyone who in life who really wants to do something who hasn't been able to do it. I think a lot of people who fall by the wayside in university are people who never quite were motivated enough to continue with what they were doing. Uh, if you're motivated to get into honours and you don't quite get the marks, do it somewhere else, do an honours equivalent somewhere else. Same with getting into clinical psych. Um, yeah, or do a GDP. 
there are ways around it. You can definitely recover. Yeah. Next question. I'm afraid to interact with people because I fear I will cause troubles and that I'm weird, yet I am also afraid of being left out. Okay. It's not that surprising we're getting these questions it's from the initial survey. But where do you start? Yeah. Who wants to jump in? Um, I'm happy to take this one. I think this one is a, a really good one for coming and seeing someone because there are some really great evidence-based support and treatment for... Um, a lot of these fears around interacting with people um, and helping you to be to not be left out um, and being able to address some of those fears of a ne negative evaluation. Um, so I would definitely recommend if this is something you're you're struggling with to to reach out and get some support on this. Yeah, okay. no quick I'll, fix, seek help. Yeah, I'll take the opportunity then to just plug the clinic. Again, <laughs> but I linger on this web page a lot longer at the beginning of the webinar if you want to skip back on the recording. Do you think all of this free time is giving humans too much time to contemplate their existence or death anxiety, leading to an increase in mental health decline? It's odd wow. because Rachel Menzies, Rachel Menzies is um, covering existential wow. crises and she has See, some really good points. I know this is impossible to answer, but every now and again, we get these fascinating questions. So mm -hmm. <laughs> who wants to answer this quickly? Good grief. Does anyone want to answer this? Again? It's really complex, but I, I think it's a really clever question. Mm. Well, I think I d definitely don't have the answer, but I think people do have a lot more time now and, you know, you find people making sourdough and, learning a language and doing a whole bunch of different things. And, and a lot of people also just take this time to consider these deeper questions. Um, so I'm, I can't answer whether it's going to lead, like whether it's, you know, causing mental health decline. I think it, this time in general is going to have effects on people's mental health because people are out of routine um, and don't have the opportunity to socialize as much. Um, but yeah, I think it can definitely lead to people considering deeper thoughts that where as in daily life, people are more distracted. Now that I've read it a few times, it seems unfair to characterize it as if you give humans too much time per se, they're just going to, they're going to despair because mm. it does talk about death anxiety, having free time at a time like this and watching the news, for example, maybe you guys can talk about, tell us about whether watching the news is a good idea because every time I tune in, I either see Donald Trump. Oh my God, it's terrible. I won't, I don't need to explain that. Or I see last, last shocking thing I saw was in Brazil, just an aerial shot of the cemeteries that they've had to dig very, very quickly. Um, if I've got too much time and I'm watching things like that, that's not good, is it? But I mean, the point is people have a choice what they expose themselves to. So if you want to contemplate your existence, contemplate it in a way that is, you know, nice and makes you feel good and don't watch, you know, videos of too many cemeteries. Yeah. You know, and like luckily, the news, people basically. A, <laughs> yes, people have a choice in, in what they devote their attention to. And I would just encourage you to, you know, choose things that make you feel good. Mm, I think that's a really good point around the news as well. Um, and there's a lot of literature and research at the moment into what the effects of watching too much of the news, particularly in this time, is. And the recommendation is to watch enough that you feel that you're informed if you need to get some facts, but not to be watching it continuously or if it's feeling like it's causing you additional anxiety because the news is designed to be more sensationalist. And this is coming from I'm a former journalist. <laughs> I know the behind the scenes of mm. how they make the, especially TV news, but um, it, it's definitely anxiety provoking at this time. So you're seeing just a lot of bad news over and over. Um, so just enough that you feel informed and then being able to take a break from it. Yeah, so it's sort of like news isn't Netflix. It's not entertainment. It's for mm. information. Mm. But if you spend yeah. the free t your free time contemplating how things could improve, how this could improve the world somehow, people's attitudes, the way people are caring for each other, um, trying to see the positive. 
in the next we'll add so andrea andrea brownlow she's one of my colleagues who looks at adult development and um death anxiety and existential thoughts to increase as you develop as an adult and so it is a part of maturation to have more of these thoughts about mm -hmm. death whether that like we have clinicians on here of course so whether that exceeds the level of stress that you would like to have then that's a problem but i guess like you were saying thinking about these things is natural think about good things watch good shows on netflix kim's Shall we answer one last question Is anyone saying kim's convenience no highly recommend it <laughs> well cantarol the sweet tooth salary man do you have um, we we've, we've sort of tackled this one lack of motivation to do work yeah we're all... running short of time um let's go to the next mark uh, mark this one has answered let's see if the next one's novel I have been seeing a therapist and psychiatrist for a couple of years now, and I have some mental illness. Can uh, I still work? Question, oh, yeah. same question here. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yes. Uh, I don't have self-confidence anymore. Again, this isn't really a question, but I guess it's people are struggling with it. We're getting down to five upvotes. The process of applying for special consideration is so difficult to accomplish when you are depressed. What would you recommend for doing a life admin in this uh, so state? Basic tasks. I mean, <clears throat> it is the case that University of Sydney has reduced the requirements for special consideration, but you still got to click on some buttons and do some paperwork. If someone's struggling to do these basic tasks, what should they be doing to just get through the basic tasks? Um, I think if possible, if they have someone that is an advocate for them or support for them, getting them to help them out, because I think that's a really good point that person has made when you are feeling depressed and really low, doing these, like life is a struggle, let alone doing these additional admin things that might sort of seem small to someone not in a deep depression, but a kind of just extra um for when you are so if if it's possible having someone to help you out with those things really can can help yeah not for your assignments folks that's academic no not getting that. some right yourself. But for <laughs> filling out forms for finding out what to do and you know what if there's no one out there who can help you um get in touch with me i'm your unit of study coordinator and the only thing that makes me annoyed is when people come to me too late and they say, you know, oh, I'm really struggling. And I say, well, you need to discontinue or withdraw or maybe lighten your load is some advice I often give. It's great to be giving that advice in week six or seven. It's a tragedy in week 12 when, it, you know, it's already a bit of a train wreck and it's too late. So come and see me if you have no one else. Um, but yeah, last note, really Caleb, advice. it's that students, students always ask about sending emails and not wanting to bother me just for second and third year students here. It's that you, your tutors are there for a reason and you can send them an email and let them decide if they can answer the question or not. You don't have to decide oh. if they can answer that question. I want to do the next one. I just looked ahead. I cheated and it's really good. And maybe this we will, can, maybe we this can will be the last on one and then we'll throw it to Nadia. We'll finish on this one. And say, mm. How do you all see the future of psychology as a career changing due to this pandemic? Let's put the screen on them, Caleb. Nadia, we'll start with you. Good luck. Okay. Um, <laughs> Nostradamus. It's a good question. It's it a is a good question. question. I'm, I've been thinking about this. I wonder if it will give kind of a boost to telehealth. Um, a lot of people are using these platforms now and they wouldn't have in other circumstances. Yeah. And so if people like it, I guess um, we could see this continuing in the future. Um, maybe momentarily people will need more support um, following um, like COVID. So maybe it will kind of, um, their psychologists will be in greater need, at least temporarily. That's it is what happens after, G after the GFC. So that is a really good what point. What was the resistance to telehealth? It took a while for the government to agree to fund it. What was the problem there? Um, my understanding was that they um, were not allowing clinicians to charge a bulk, um, a, mm -hmm. a fee following after um, the gap was covered. Oh, okay. I haven't really kept up. Miranda, Astra, do you guys have anything to add? Um, I think maybe it will, like now that it's so widely used, maybe it will allow for greater flexibility in the sense that, mm. for instance, 
you know, for people in remote areas or um, Aboriginal communities, you know, sort of people who don't usually have access to a lot of mental health structure, maybe there will be more of a, you know, basis or more people actually offering telehealth for people in those locations, which would be a really good thing because, you know, I was given to understand that there's some areas in rural Australia that really struggle mm. with their mental health support. So that would be a good outcome, hopefully. And I think as well as um, all the, the telehealth side of things, I think it's also brought mental health and getting help for struggling kind of to a larger audience that we're all aware of our mental health a bit more. And so we might see more of a preventative um, or like a, a small intervention where you go and have sort of a top up one or two sessions when you're um, feeling like you're not coping as well. So I think that's been, might be a thing that we've seen. It's been really good to have lots of conversations around mental health and coping. Uh, it's sort of normalised, hasn't it? Mm, definitely. Yeah, which is good. Maybe also oh, open oh, the door oh, for, oh. for people to, you know, see a psychologist even if they don't have a mental illness. You know, yes. that's not something that's usually done. You see a psychologist because you have a mental illness, not because oh. you would like help with something that's distressing but doesn't necessarily meet the threshold for a diagnosis of any kind. So maybe mm. that'll bring a shift in awareness as well. Has this crisis, in a sense, made mental health services more accessible? do you think? Or have they just been promoted better? Mm -hmm. Telehealth is one innovation that's brought mental health closer to the population. Is it going to remain as difficult to become a psychologist as it is now? Do you think probably. this will change? <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> Something. Shall we, shall we wrap up then? It is, oh, we are I, like, I just want to go back to one thing which I prepared and oops, hang on. If I can skip. Yeah. Oh, some oh. people have already answered this. How do you feel you, about the future? If you haven't answered this, you can take a shot. Nadia, now. Miranda, Astrid, how do you guys feel about the future? Things will definitely get better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty positive. I think that there will definitely be challenges ahead, but I don't think um, a good future is without challenges. Hmm. I've, I've always had an issue with, is it called Are You OK Day? Mm -hmm. When's that? Oh no, actually, I know when that is. Is that in September? In September, but they had a second one last week as well. Right. Okay. No, I have an issue of it with it because Are You Okay Day occasionally falls on the anniversary of my brother murdering my mother, <laughs> and I once wrote to the Sydney Morning Herald and they published my letter and I said, look, I don't know how helpful the slogan is because um, obviously that's a terrible. Um, anniversary for me to revisit every year but um, rather than being asked are you okay if someone asked me that on that day I'd probably tell them to go to hell ask people will you be okay will mm -hmm. you get through this will you cope and that's kind of mm -hmm. what I was getting at with this question because it's a good thing if people are now particularly now in Australia with the easing of restrictions it's a good thing if people are feeling positive about the future mm -hmm. that things will get better but I've got those negative ones there too, because unfortunately, thanks to mm -hmm. unemployment and economic changes, and unfortunately, people still being trapped from international travel, things aren't necessarily going to get better. So it was more just to give a, an outlook. Diversity, again, yeah. Well, and again, to normalise this idea that no, some people, yeah, we're out of the woods, or at least we feel we are, but other people know we might um, slip back into some into a dark place whether it's economically or psychologically so, so let do me you wrap have up. any closing comments <laughs> nadia astrid oh, oh, hang on let me just wrap up one more time by promoting the clinic and just saying if anyone has an unanswered question because there are 60, 60 odd or something like that and you need personal assistance then psychology clinic or counseling mental health support um closing comments Um, <laughs> I, think, well, so I don't know how we can sum it up. Yeah, reiterating kind of everything that we've spoken about of that it's normal at this time to, to be mm. feeling anxious or having low mood or low motivation or not being productive, but to, to recognize that that's, that's okay and being kind to yourself and doing those small things that you can each day, like Nadia talked about, and routines.
Yeah, it's normal to be challenged at this time. Be kind to yourself. Nadia? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I don't think I have much more to add right now. <laughs> I think that was the first thing you said in the webinar, Nadia, and it was so beautifully said that everyone's struggled yeah. to top it since then. Be kind to yourself. Go easy on yourself. Um, anything to add summing up, Astrid? No, I think this was great. I really enjoyed it. I think it's good to keep the dialogue going. Awesome. Yep. Well, I usually compress this or do something to it and then stick it up on YouTube so that those who missed out can have a look. And we might do something like this again in future. We are planning a careers one on this coming Friday at two o'clock. And I might distribute this to second and third year too, if they think that'll be helpful. That's why I was kind of being a bit nasty with the careers ones and skipping through them. We did answer a few, but that's why I was kind of skipping through them. But look, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Sean and I have been facing questions like that the last few weeks and we've always been kind of passing them on and yep. avoiding them because we don't have any expertise. Um, but thanks so much for joining us and assisting and Thank assisting the students me. who are watching. And you guys have been fantastic. Um, and thanks also to all the students who participated and supplied such good questions. There's a lot of people saying thanks in the comments now. So. Cool. cool. I'll, I'll end it now before the file goes gets beyond three terabytes. In my See you guys on Friday, that. students. See you on tomorrow, Caleb. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Astro, Miranda, and Nadia. Thanks for the help. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.